but this book just, it just flows. And the ahas were like fireworks going off with me. And one of the first ones, you lay this foundation of why, you know, American marriage, specifically American, but most Western cultures um, is set up for failure. Just the way we're socialized, the way our cultural, and just knowing that releases this pressure of failure for, you know, these, I know so many people going through divorce right now and are struggling with relationships. Um, and, you know, the 50% statistic, if you think about it, it's like, okay, 50% of people get divorced ish. Right. So that's not a great statistic. And now we understand why with how you've laid it out, but then mm -hmm. you realize that the other 50% of people staying marriage out of those people, 80% are really unhappy and miserable and not doing the work. So um, it just, you you give us so much relief. I don't know if you want to touch on the basics of that to give them a little ditty. Happy to, yeah. Um, what I started to observe when I was working with couples in particular, but anybody who's, you know, desiring of connection. And what I, what I started to see was that they would have parts that were desperately looking for the right person, Mr. and Mrs. Wright out there to take care of these parts, that the parts themselves were very young and often uh, scared and needy and desperate for approval from somebody who could prove that they weren't worthless because these young parts often come out of our families with that, what I call the burden of worthlessness, the sense that, that um, they're not valuable because one of your parents gave them that message and and they were desperate to be redeemed by that parent and the parent never really did. And so you walk around feeling, it could be not just worthlessness, but also terror. You walk around looking for the protector in your partner or with the worthlessness, you look around for somebody who might resemble your parent to try and get that person at least to tell you you're valuable. Um, and, and so when we're, doing that search for a partner, um, we're doing it from these young parts usually. And when we find that person who does resemble the, the parent and who does affirm us, then we become elated. We, we feel infatuated with that person. Finally, somebody is telling that part of me that it's valuable. Unfortunately, that person often is like your parent and winds up hurting you in the same way. And when they hurt you, then you're right back to feeling that worthlessness or that terror again. And so most of us will go into one of four projects to deal with the, that emergency. One of them being to try and change your partner back and into being that redeemer, the one who can make you feel so great. And when that doesn't work to change yourself so that your partner likes you again, maybe you lose weight or you, you do stop criticizing or whatever it is. When that doesn't work, often you start to think, maybe this wasn't the right redeemer. Maybe that person's still out there and you start looking around. And when you get burned enough times by doing that, then you just say, I give up on a human being. I'm gonna do something else to, to deal with this and just live with the worthlessness. So that's what I found in, in most relationships. Uh, and the, the, the answer is in the title of the book that there is this self in us who can become the one that these parts have been looking for. So you can become that primary caretaker of your own exiled parts. You can help them unburden the worthlessness and the terror and then you can look for a partner from a very different place, from those eight Cs. And when you find that partner, they don't have to be the primary caretaker of your exiles. You're already doing that. They can be the secondary caretaker. And so they don't feel all this pressure to make you feel good. And they don't get your insecurity when they, they have a bad day and so on. Uh, so it's easier for your partner too. Yeah. And that's, a, I mean, that's like an unrealistic burden to place on someone, which is why we cling. And then what we fear the most, we actually manifest because we're right. pushing yeah. 
we're pushing them away, we're clinging, we're needy, we're doing all the things, but it's this out of control part of us that is just so desperate for love. And it's not desperate for love out there. It's desperate for us to recognize it after we exile, you know, usually the, this all happened, you know, the trauma happens in childhood. Of course, things happen in life that can create new exiles, but you know, these parts of us, this like gregarious, you know, performer or this, you know, more kind of whatever these parts were that we were ashamed of or ashamed by one of our parents or an authority figure that we've exiled, they're just screaming for love. And the whole point of your work is to go, you are the one you are waiting for because you can't have a healthy relationship until you are able to hold the container and love all your parts. Otherwise you're going to be needy and grasping or, you know, and then when you don't get what you want, then your protector voices, you know, and your defense mechanisms will come up. It You lay it out so clearly. It's like, and I've done IFS with a therapist before and I, mm-hmm. I was blown away and, and it was super effective, but I have to tell you, it was like, it's like grueling work, you know, at first to try to kind of learn this and to go back in time and like revisit kind of that, you know, um, attachment injury or the trauma that happened, it's painful. But once you start mm-hmm. practicing it and, and for me, you know, I've done it with the therapist and it's hard work, but then after reading your book, it feels like I just have a whole new software program downloaded, a new lens through which to look where I can understand it and start to practice it on my own. Because yeah. awareness, you know, is the first step of like unloading that pain is awareness, right? That's right. Yeah. And and that is a big goal of uh, the work is to help people like you be able to do this on their own. Um, maybe not all of it, but do a lot of it on their own because it's it's pretty possible once you get to know these parts and you you stop hating them and start getting open to them, they welcome your your attention and and then there are times where, like you were saying, you want to revisit those those attachment injuries and those places where they're stuck in the past and get them out of there, and that can be very painful. But ultimately, that journey through the pain leads to what we call an unburdening, the part to be able to unload the pain it carries and the terror and the shame too. Now, is it possible, like if, you know, I'm reading the book, I've done IFS, is it possible to stay, like, how do you know if a relationship is, because relationships do run their course, two wounded individuals come, they learn, one grows, one doesn't, they both grow to a point and life soul god has other plans for them it's one chapter I, I believe that is a reality too so how like how do you know when to keep doing the work in a certain relationship or if one of you's looking inward and doing the work and the other is not is you know is that sustainable like talk to me about that a little bit yeah it's it's very hard to know when you're what we call blended with these parts and their burdens because they really can distort your uh your view of your partner. So um, as I was saying earlier, if you have a exile who's who was initially desperately attached to your partner and then your partner does something hurtful, this protector will take over and blend with you to the point where you're looking through the eyes of this angry part who only sees ugliness in your partner. Uh, it's quite amazing. I'm not, I, I've been through this a lot with my wife, where this woman who I think is quite beautiful suddenly looks unappealing. And it's because she hurt me during the day and this part took over. And so that, you know, other people call it projection. It's like you're not seeing your partner for who she is. You're seeing uh, the part's view, which is very related usually to the way it felt toward your parent who hurt you in the same way. So it's really hard to tell if a relationship is worth working on uh, while these parts are in their extreme states. It's, it isn't until they're willing to trust you to look through those eyes of clarity, you know, that C word clarity, and actually see your partner for who he or she really is that you can actually have the information you need to decide whether this is worth it or not. Totally. 
you give so many like um obviously change the names but you give so many examples in the book like the Helen and Kevin example is such a great you know as you walk us through there's so many relatable things about our own lives so I'd love for you to share like just kind of specific examples of how some protectors show up or what parts of us and why have we exiled these, you know, children to the basement? Um, just so people can relate to like, oh yeah, I maybe exiled, I have that exile or I have that protector active right now. Well, I could talk about my own system and my my wife and I, sure. although she'll kill me if she ever hears this. So. <laughs> Sorry, Gene. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so, my father uh, was the one parent that I felt love from. And so when, when he was being loving, it was fabulous for me. And I, he was a you know big figure and I was desperate for his approval. But on a dime, he could shift and get very angry. If I screwed up in any way, he would become quite shaming and uh, a lot of the burdens of worthlessness I carried out of my family were based on that. And, and so, you know, I spent time looking for someone who was as smart as him to tell me I was valuable. And so Jean is, is like that. And, uh, and she also, like him, has a temper. And so uh, sometimes when I screw up, she can go from zero to 100 very quickly. And that will trigger that little guy who was so desperate to have my father's love and who felt so terrible afterwards. And then that brings in my big time protectors who either totally withdraw and shut down or will kind of totally counter <laughs> um, Compared to her protector, it's pretty feeble. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then we're off to the races. And what I've you know, learned to do, and, and she has too, is to just pause and each of us do what we call a U-turn in our focus. So focus inside and find the parts that are doing the talking and then find the parts they're protecting. So I found that little guy with my father and then witness what that was like for him and then see the parallel that's happening with, with my wife and then come back and speak for those parts. So just let her know, uh, I, ha I know I have a big reaction when you shift like that. And this is what I've learned about why and I'm gonna work with that guy so he doesn't have as big a reaction. In the meantime, it would be very helpful if you didn't uh, you know, act like my father and <laughs> explode on me. <laughs> and, uh, and I understand that you know, that protector in you is protecting something too. And uh, so I don't expect you to do a perfect job, but I'm coming and speaking from self for that little one and also for the part that protects it. So that's a lot of what we're trying to help couples do is because when you get triggered like that, your first impulse is to either run or attack or freeze. And we're inviting you instead to just focus inside. Mm -hmm. Like I said, many times you have to get some space to do that. But listen to the stories of these parts and what's why they're so triggered. And, uh, you know, if you don't have the time or the setup in the moment to actually do a healing piece with them, at least come back to your partner and let them know the damage they're doing. Uh, not in a shaming way, but just, excuse me, this is the impact of that protector in you. And I kind of get that it's protecting something and vulnerable too. And so you're, you're trying to get the protectors to let you speak for the vulnerability. 
and yeah, so that and speak from self, from those C-word qualities to your partner. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.